here the YouTube is still chugging along. Looks like it. Good. Welcome everybody to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night by Zoom 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome back to Wednesday Night Lab, PJ Leash. He's the extension entomologist in the Department of Entomology here. And he also is the director of the Insect Diagnostics Lab. PJ, I get to ask you the five questions. Where were you born? Racine, Wisconsin. And let's see. Oh, I'm trying to change the view here. And where'd you go to high school? J.I. Case High School in Racine. And then where'd you go for your undergrad and what did you study? Uh, UW Parkside and I got a degree in biological sciences and I came about that close to being a chemist though. I, I loved organic chemistry. Way to dodge those bullets. And then uh, where did you go for your master's degree? Uh, UW Madison here and uh, never left town. So I've been around since 07. Very good. And when did you become um, director of the uh, insect diagnostics lab? Uh, so my predecessor, Phil Pelletieri, retired uh, February of 2014, and uh, March 1st, 2014 uh, was my first day at the lab. So this is my, oh. I usually keep, keep track of things by the number of summers I survive. So this is year seven at this point. That's astonishing. Seems like only yesterday. Yeah, time flies. Yeah. So tonight you're going to talk with us about uh, tracking insects in Wisconsin in the year of COVID. I'm looking forward to hearing what, if any, effects the pandemic may have had on what you're seeing in the lab. And sure. uh, go ahead and you can start anytime you'd like. Yeah, all right. Let me get my slides pulled up here. All right. Well, thanks very much for the, the invite, Tom. It's been a couple of years since I last did Wednesday night at the lab. So it is really good to be here uh, talking about some of the insect trends and, and things have been, well, interesting the last uh, year or so with the, the COVID pandemic. It, it has had some impacts on various insects and, and the number of cases of those insects that I've seen, which I'll dive into uh, tonight. But uh, first, I want to start off just by talking a little bit about what I do at the lab so you have a better idea of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And in short, no two days are quite the same for me. Um, but what I do at the lab gives me a pretty good picture of what's going on in both Wisconsin, but also the Midwest region in terms of insect activity. So uh, I'll talk, as I said, first about what I do at the lab, then some changes that came about with COVID, and then we'll talk about some of the main insect trends that I've seen over about the last year and a half. So that's kind of a roadmap of, of where I'm going with tonight's lecture. So just to give you a little bit more background in terms of what I do, so I serve as director of the UW Insect Diagnostic Lab. The lab itself was established back in the 1970s, so it's been around over 40 years uh, at this point, and what's kind of cool about the lab itself when it was started up, it was really a, a short term experiment with some temporary funding for a couple months to see, you know, would it be a success? Would uh, folks be using and, and utilizing the services of the lab? And well, here we are 40 plus years later. So it is a, a very popular service. And in a nutshell, what I do, I tell folks very simply, I get paid to identify bugs. That's kind of the simplest way to put it. Uh, in many ways, it is kind of a, a dream job in that regard, just to think of, of getting a salary to identify insects. There's, of course, a lot more to it than that. But uh, in general, I provide arthropod identification services at the lab. So that's insects and really just about anything else, creepy crawly spiders, uh, sometimes ticks, uh, centipedes, millipedes, and, and some other oddities uh, as well. And I really pride myself on uh, turnaround time at the lab. In most cases, um, usually I'd say about 75, 80 plus percent of cases, I have a turnaround time of about a business day or less and, and pretty much all the cases within about uh, two business days or so. So it's really rapid turnaround. But uh, during the summer months, which is uh, my busiest time 
time of the year, I really have to stay on top of things. Otherwise, it would just uh, kind of accumulate and be hard to, to get out of. So lots of things coming through my door this time of the year. So in addition to identifying things, I can help provide some basic uh, insect and management advice. I do have extension colleagues that work in cropping systems such as field crops or vegetable or fruit crops. And so for more commercial type uh, production scenarios like that, my colleagues are really providing their expertise, but uh, I interact a lot with the general public. So this could be uh, someone just calling up saying, I have carpenter ants in my house, what can I do about it? So I, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one kind of consultation with folks throughout Wisconsin, uh, giving them some basic advice. And sometimes it's just providing a, a management fact sheet. In other cases, it's uh, having phone or email conversations with them as well. So I, of course, do get to spend a fair amount of time um, at the microscope looking at uh, insects. And, and sometimes these days, uh, now that I've been doing it several years, it takes me longer to respond than it does to identify the insect if it's something common like Japanese beetles and, and stuff like that. There are other cases, though, where I may have to spend hours, if not longer, and I'll talk about one really interesting case later on um, that took me uh, about a week or so to really track down the resources to uh, identify that insect. That's a, a cool story I'll share with you later on. So I, I'm constantly getting things in the mail, packages of, of insects and other creatures, and at the end of the year, I've got a, a big uh, folder full of that year's uh, case files, as well as an email archive of all the cases, and those get databased, and I can look at trends over time uh, and that sort of thing. So those are some of my main things that I do at the diagnostic lab. Oops. Uh, I also provide a lot of outreach. So that's interacting with master gardener groups, speaking at uh, agricultural field days and things like that, uh, giving seminars to public groups, gardening clubs, library groups, and, and so on. Do a lot of scientific communication, be it on social media like Twitter. I'm a regular guest on Wisconsin Public Radio, such as the Larry Mueller Show and, and other shows. I produce a lot of uh, fact sheets and infographics, and I have an uh, insect blog on my website that I post about once a month on. So if you're interested in seeing some of the main trends that I do uh, post regularly on the blog on my website. And then I also formally have a, a teaching appointment on campus. I, I teach in the farm and industry short course program. So I really have a lot of different irons in the fire, but I get to do, do a lot of really fun stuff out there as well. Now, the thing about the diagnostic lab and, and work at the lab is that no two days are the, uh, the same. So um, with that said, life at the diagnostic lab is a little bit like a box of chocolates in that regard. Now, on a day-to-day -day basis, what type of questions do I get at the lab? The commonest question is, what is this, um, first and foremost? And then a lot of times it's followed up by, how do I get rid of this? Or how do I kill this? And, and there certainly are cases where it's uh, okay to kind of draw the line in the sand, but there's also a lot of situations where I have to communicate with folks and say, well, it doesn't really make sense because uh, you, know, you don't need to kill an insect. It's a harmless or even a beneficial creature. And so I have to do uh, that type of communication as well. I also get other common questions like, is this creature poisonous or venomous? That's probably the number one question I get when it comes to spider ID requests at the lab. And then I also get a very common question, how do I keep creature XYZ alive as a pet? In a lot of situations, many insects don't necessarily make the best pets out there, but uh, those are the commonest questions I get. At the other end of the spectrum, I can get some very bizarre questions out there. So if you are all familiar with or have heard of the uh, uh, party game uh, Cards Against Humanity, which is a word association game. You get a black card and you have to play white cards to make a word association. Well, just as a, a little bit of a, a joke here, um, so this was a, a case that uh, was a legitimate phone conversation I had. Uh, so I just finished a phone conversation regarding uh, advice on getting rid of human remains. This was a request that came in from uh, an individual that worked at uh, a funeral parlor and and they had a request from the client. Uh, they wanted to be consumed by scarab beetles uh, after they passed away. And so I had to explain the dynamics of how insects are involved in cases like that and, and how it's actually things like maggots, the larvae of flies that would really do uh, kind of the heavy lifting in a case like that. And it wasn't really feasible to uh, be able to accommodate that type of request, but uh, just goes to show I can get some very, very weird questions at times. 
Uh, now, what does a case look like at the Insect Diagnostic Lab? Well, essentially, any request that I get to identify an insect or other arthropod. So it could be uh, a bottle like this of live flying beetles. They weren't quite flying anymore because they had been uh, in the mail for a couple of days, and, and most of them were no longer live at that point. Um, but I do get lots of physical samples in the mail. Sometimes I don't know quite what's in the box when it arrives. Um, this particular box piqued my interest. I was really hoping I was going to get some bacon or something like that from Newski's. Ended up just being uh, some plant uh, leaves in there with insects on them. But it uh, just goes to show I get all kinds of things in the mail, including some really neat stuff. Uh, occasionally I get some really fascinating cases. Uh, these vials on the bottom right hand corner are actually some lice from goats that were at the Milwaukee County Zoo. So I get to see some insects and other arthropods that the general public just would never uh, see. You might read about them in the literature uh, if you bumped onto them or were browsing Wikipedia at the wee hours of the morning or something like that. But uh, I do get to see plenty of physical specimens. These days, though, a lot of my cases involve or entirely revolve around digital photographs. And, and workload at the diagnostic lab really shifted with the invention of the digital camera. Because these days with smartphones, pretty much everyone has an 8, 10, 12 plus megapixel camera in your pocket. So in a lot of situations, you can take a pretty good picture of an insect, email it to me at the diagnostic lab. And because I'm able to zoom in on the screen can often get a pretty good idea of what it is from that. And then the rest of my cases kind of involve a game of 20 questions where someone I have on the phone is maybe describing an insect and I have to ask questions such as how large was it? What type of behavior did you observe? Sometimes even questions like, was it producing a sound? Sound, or does it smell a certain way? Those can be diagnostic clues in, in certain situations. So there are certain cases where I can identify insects simply from the description alone. Now, when COVID-19 came about, uh, that certainly, uh, you know, threw a monkey wrench into the, the machine for everyone. We all had to adjust to um, the work-life balance when uh, COVID popped up. So back in about March of 2020, I, like most folks on campus, had to shift to working at home. That meant um, spending lots of time in my basement, more time than I've ever spent in my basement ever before. I'm currently down in my basement computer room. Luckily, I had a pretty good setup because I've had microscopes at home for years or, or really decades. I already had some of the equipment on hand, had to borrow some things like Petri dishes and stuff like that. And then mostly it involved lugging boxes of very heavy books uh, into my basement for reference work. So since March 2020, I've been working mostly at home. Although even throughout the pandemic, I was taking regular trips into campus because remember, I've got those samples and specimens arriving regularly in the mail. So I would have to process those. Um, a lot of times you don't want insect samples to sit too long because because they may start to degrade or, or decompose, making them harder to identify. So I would pop in regularly a couple of times a week during the summer months, uh, especially during the busy season, to pick up those samples and uh, go from there. Um, when I was on campus, I would basically kind of triage those samples, if you will, uh, quickly look at some that uh, I could maybe identify right off the bat. In other cases, I may make the decision that those need uh, some more significant time under the microscope, and I would bring them home to my basement lab to work on them here. Now, some other things uh, came about with uh, COVID that involved uh, some additional lab assistance. So when I'm on campus, it's just me in the diagnostic lab. When I'm at home, I had uh, some assistance, um, at least uh, keeping me company, although lab assistant number one, Luna, and uh, lab assistant number two, Charles Darwin, although we just call him Charlie for the most part. Um, they were around, although they always seem to be asleep on the job, but uh, I can't blame them being black labs. Um, lab assistant number three, though, you have to watch out for. She's a little bit rambunctious. Uh, she'd try and eat uh, specimens on occasion, so I have to keep an eye on her, but uh, pretty cute uh, in, as far as a furry lab assistant goes. Some other changes that came about with COVID. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I was a regular guest on Wisconsin Public Radio, but with COVID, couldn't go into the WPR studios on campus, so that meant finding uh, the best spot in my house that was quietest, had good phone reception, Wi-Fi reception, and so on. That turns out to be a little room we call our reading nook, which is just off our kitchen. Uh, but just outside the windows there on the left-hand side of the picture is the mailbox. And uh, lab assistant number one and two like to announce uh, very vocally when uh, mail or packages are delivered. So when I would be on air on Larry Mueller's show, the dogs would have to go into the basement computer room uh, so I could keep them as 
quiet as possible. So definitely some interesting changes like that. We also had some questions that came about when COVID uh, popped up, like would it have an effect on caseload? And I'll get into more details of that just in a couple minutes. Um, there also were some challenges, but also some opportunities when it came to outreach. Um, with all the talks that I give each year, it's often somewhere in the ballpark of maybe 75 or so talks. Most of those would uh, traditionally be in person. With COVID, that simply wasn't a, a possibility due to a number of reasons. And so that meant shifting uh, outreach events to online formats and, and things of that nature. Um, so that did uh, provide some challenges. But again, it also provided some really unique opportunities, like being able to reach larger audiences at broader scales. Uh, as an example of that, uh, last year in July of 2020, uh, with uh, colleagues in the Extension Horticulture Group, I was able to deliver a really a statewide uh, seminar on Japanese beetles. And we ended up having about 1,500 or so people sign up. So that's uh, kind of neat when you can give one talk and reach a really big audience versus if it were in person, it'd probably be a, a much smaller audience, you know, maybe 50 or 100 folks or, or so on. So uh, COVID definitely did have some uh, impacts on my day-to-day -day work in the uh, diagnostic lab with diagnostics, but also in terms of outreach as well. Now let's look at uh, a snapshot of the lab in terms of some of the statistics coming out of the lab from 2019. So this will kind of step the stage pre-COVID and then my next slide will be once COVID hit and we'll look at some of those numbers. So when we look at 2019, I had about 2,500 cases. The actual count was 2,542 and that's an all-time record for the diagnostic lab in terms of number of annual cases. So 2019 was an extremely busy year. That year I received samples from all 72 of Wisconsin County. So that's kind of cool, really, um, you know, getting at that heart of the Wisconsin idea and being able to help folks in every single uh, part of the state uh, is always very rewarding at the end of the day. Um, and better yet, about seven or 95% or more of the cases that I handled that year were from within Wisconsin. I do get to live a little bit vicariously, though, through my work. I get to see photographs of insects from other states and uh, sometimes other countries, including about a dozen foreign countries in 2019. And then in terms of the format of the samples, about 64% of the cases in 2019 involve digital images. So again, these days, most folks have that smartphone in their pocket. They can take some really good digital images. In a lot of cases, we can figure out what it is just from that. About a third of my uh, samples that year were physical samples, and then the rest, a uh, small percent, were descriptions. And then in terms of where those cases came from, about half of them were from the general public. Uh, about uh, 20 to 25 ish percent were from uh, colleagues in extension offices, so county agriculture, horticulture agents, and, and county staff, that sort of thing. And then the rest were from various groups, private industry, the green industry, so tree care, arborists, things like uh, that, lawn care folks, pest control professionals, medical um, professionals, doctors, dermatologists, and so on. And then also some from government agencies and other educational institutions and so on. So that kind of sets the stage pre-COVID. Then when we look at the pandemic year, so my uh, final tally for 2020, uh, right about the same, 2,533, so less than 10 off. So despite the pandemic, um, you know, really impacting a lot of our everyday lives, my caseload was essentially about the same. So another very busy year at the diagnostic lab last year. In terms of my current caseload this year, there's a little bit of a lag in terms of cases and when I get those documented in my database. But at the moment, I'm about 1,500 or more cases which is right on par to hit about 2,500 by the end of the year. So another very busy year around the diagnostic lab. Uh, since COVID started, have also had cases from all 72 counties. So again, a lot of impact throughout the state. About 95% of those cases have been uh, from within Wisconsin, uh, about 22 other U.S. states and 11 foreign countries. So again, not many cases coming from outside of Wisconsin or out of the U.S., but I do get to live a little bit vicariously that way. Now, here's some really interesting things. So as I, I mentioned a moment ago, caseload, it was about the same despite COVID, but we saw some shifts in some of these numbers. So instead of about half of the cases involving digital photography, last year due to COVID, about 75% of the cases 
involve uh, digital images. A reason for that, um, campus was closed down. Otherwise, in a, a non-COVID year, folks regularly pop into my lab and drop off samples, that sort of thing. Um, also, in terms of physical samples, I saw a drop there down to about 20%. And a reason for that, again, with COVID, folks weren't coming into campus, but also due to health reasons, folks maybe didn't want to go to the, the mail uh, or post office to mail packages in. So we, I did see a big increase in digital samples last year. If you were to chat with my uh, colleague and counterpart, Dr. Brian Huddleston, who is in charge of the UW Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic, he saw a somewhat similar trend. A uh, lot more digital images last year, and then the rest of mine were descriptions. In terms of the case sources, I did see an increase in general public. I suspect what was going on is with COVID, folks are working from home, which meant more time out in yards and gardens. And so that simply gave them more opportunities to notice the insects in their yards around them. And then I also saw a decrease in cases coming from extension colleagues. And a reason for this is probably with COVID, they were working from home. So they didn't have as many folks bringing cases and samples into their county offices to get forwarded on uh, to me. And then the rest, of course, from uh, green industry, pest control, medical uh, professionals, and, and government agencies and other educational institutions. Those percentages I don't have up here, but have been about the same as in previous years. It's just been a shift in general public and extension since COVID came about. Now, with COVID, we have also had uh, some shifts in the way that Americans go about our everyday lives. So if you're like me, you've been doing things like curbside grocery pickup, and a lot of folks have been ordering things from Amazon. I mean, think about that. If we had a time machine and could chat with someone 100 years ago and tell them that we can order something on this device called a computer, and it'll show up on our doorstep two days later from Amazon, I mean, that would just be pretty befuddling to think about. Um, that also has some complications, though, when it comes to insects, because there are insects that can hide away in, in packages, especially these days, we have sometimes items shipping directly from China to the US, and there's uh, an opportunity for certain insects to be in there. So with that said, around Wisconsin and other parts of the US, we have some cockroach species such as the American roach, which isn't particularly common here. I occasionally see them in the state in larger buildings where there's steam tunnels and things like that. But just in the last year or so, I've had a couple of cases of Australian roach roaches where goods have been shipped either from China or from southern parts of the US. So we can see when we have the movement and shipping of human goods, sometimes insects can be moved along with that. Another interesting example along these lines, uh, also involving Amazon in this case, um, this was an individual who ordered some bamboo reusable drinking straws, trying to be an environmentally conscious, of course, to have those reusable straws rather than disposable plastic ones. But when they received these bamboo bamboo straws uh, from the online vendor. They noticed some frass, so some bits of sawdust and, and that type of material. And they noticed tunneling inside the bamboo, so they sent that sample in, uh, found some insects in there, and identified them under the microscope as this creature called the bamboo boar, which is native to other parts of the planet, can be a pest of bamboo, which we don't have here in Wisconsin, of course. But another good illustration of a case where insects can get moved around with the shipment of goods. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit. I know I've been talking about COVID impacts. Now what I'd like to do the rest of the talk is give you a survey of some of the main insect stories that I've seen around Wisconsin in about the last year and a half. And, and I will have some tidbits uh, of uh, relevant COVID impacts in there as well. But let's start out with the group we refer to as the Coleoptera. These are the beetles. Um, so things like fireflies and June bugs and, and so on. And for me, 2020 started out off on kind of a, a weird footing involving beetles. In this case, it was a creature called a blister beetle, uh, the family Meloidae. We actually have a bunch of different species in the state. Um, the story with these is they often will show up out of the blue, hang out for a couple of days nibbling on plants, and then they just kind of disappear on their own. And usually they're not hurting much. The thing about blister beetles, though, is they contain a defensive chemical called cantharidin, which can cause blistering on your skin if you were to crush one of these on your skin. Now, it also turns out that horses are highly sensitive to 
this chemical cantharidin. So if you have a hay field with blister beetles in it and the hay is cut and crimped and flattened and the beetles get squished in there, essentially this chemical can be present in the hay horses eat it at a later point in time and, and it can have very severe consequences. So for me, 2020 actually started off the year um, with uh, samples involving hay. It had originated in uh, places like South Dakota, came to Wisconsin near Wisconsin Dells where there was a riding stable, ended up having about 14 or 15 horses die, um, ended up finding evidence of blister beetles in the hay. So that was kind of a weird start, uh, perhaps foreshadowing for the year 2020. Um, On to some scarab beetles. Uh, there's a very diverse family, scarabiidae. These include the May June beetles or, or so-called June bugs. Also include some common uh, other species like rose chafers, which here in Madison we don't quite see. Uh, they occur in parts of the state with sandier soil. So if you go just north of us a little bit towards Wisconsin River and Central Sands area, these can be fairly common. In 2020, they were somewhat average or below average around the state. But this year, I think based on the weather patterns, their numbers were really low and, and bad years for these. I get a lot of reports during the month of June into early July before they taper off. Um, if you have seen these before, um, they are somewhat similar in size to Japanese beetle. They feed in a lot of the same plants as Japanese beetle, cause similar damage. They just occur a little bit earlier in the year. Um, so again, those were pretty low this year. Same kind of thing with Japanese beetles. This year across the board, they seem to be uh, having a lower than average year. Uh, in most spots of the state, which is much to the relief of home gardeners and landscapers and so on, because Japanese beetles are a non-native invasive species and they can cause a, a lot of damage to a very, very wide range of plants. However, one interesting trend that I have been noticing just in the last couple of years in particular is the Northwoods push of this particular pest. Now, if you were to draw a line through Wisconsin from about the Twin Cities area across to Green Bay, so essentially that Highway 29 corridor, if you were anywhere south of that line and told me you bumped into Japanese beetles, it really wouldn't surprise me all that much. They've been in the state now for several decades, seem to be pretty well established in most parts of Southern Wisconsin. What's been really interesting to me, perhaps due to change in climate and, and perhaps change in, in shifts in winter winter temperatures is that these seem to be getting more footholds in northern parts of the state. So in the last couple of years, I've now been getting um, more regular reports from Hayward and Spooner area. So Washburn, Sawyer counties, places like that. Also Oneida and Vilas County uh, in north central Wisconsin, Florence County in northeastern Wisconsin have also had reports from colleagues up in Marquette, Michigan. And we also had a, a case about two-ish years ago from Bayfield County, which is as far north as you can get in the state. So we are seeing some trends with this particular insect where it is pushing its way northwards into more northern parts of Wisconsin. Some other important beetles to mention um, that we have seen really spreading around the state in the last decade or so, emerald ash borer. And for me personally, this was my gateway bug. Uh, when I was at UW Parkside as an undergrad student, um, this got my foot in the door to become an entomologist at the time. Uh, I was living in Racine area, but got linked up with Chris Williamson, who was our, our landscape and ornamental entomologist at the time. I did two summers of work as an intern surveying for signs and symptoms of emerald ash borer in uh, southern parts of the state, eventually came on board with Chris for my graduate work, worked for him as a technician, and then uh, rolled over into my position at the diagnostic lab. So this is an insect that I have been working with one way or another for about 15 or more years at this point. And so for me, it really came full circle in the last year or so. This picture on the left, that's actually a green ash tree in my backyard that I decided to take down because we'd rather prefer to put some other types of trees in there rather than having to keep treating it with an insecticide every single year. Now, some trends statewide that are worth noting, um, and, and for Southern Wisconsin, where most of us are probably located, we've been dealing with this for a while, and, and so maybe it's a little bit uh, you know, beating a dead horse. We just don't think about it because we've been bombarded with it so much, but there's still many areas in the state where emerald ash borer has not yet gotten to. So in 2020, we had six new county level detections, 
all in northern parts of the state, Dunn, Florence, Oconto, Pepin, Price, and Shawano counties. And then thus far in 2021, three new county level detections, Barron, Iron County up by Hurley, and then Langlade County, northeastern Wisconsin. So at this point, 61 of the 72 Wisconsin counties have confirmed detections of emerald ash borer. Now, what really jumps out to me, though, is this map, because um, what this shows to me is that emerald ash borer, yes, it, it's got a very strong foothold in southern Wisconsin, but most of the state has not yet seen it. So this is something that is still going to be playing out over the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years, if not longer. So when we look at this map, the greenish areas are townships where emerald ash borer is confirmed, blue are uh, tribal lands where it's been confirmed, uh, and then the yellowish areas and, and gray areas are locations where emerald ash borer has not yet been found. So we can see the southern third of the state Emerald ash borer is widespread, found pretty much everywhere you go looking for it. The kind of middle portion of the state, though, it's a scattering, maybe 50-50 mix of EAB has been found and then other areas where it hasn't been found. Once we get to that northern third of the state, though, there's isolated little pockets where it's been detected, meaning that most of northern Wisconsin has yet to see this insect. Now, what scares me as an entomologist, though, is when I start thinking about the ecology of this insect and what it may do to landscapes as a whole. When we think about southern Wisconsin, especially urban areas, we had a lot of ash trees planted, especially after Dutch elm disease came through. So yes, there's some changes to the urban forest. But when you think about the number of ash trees in the state, most of them are in northern locations. For example, in northern Wisconsin, you can have swampy areas that can easily be 75, 80, even 90 plus percent black ash. And if you have emerald ash borer come in and take out that almost monoculture of ash trees, that's going to have some important impacts on the landscape. And some of those trees like black ash can be culturally very important for Native American groups as well. So this doesn't uh, just impact economics, it impacts cultural um, things for Native American tribes, it has a lot of impacts overall, including on the ecosystem. So again, this is something that's going to be playing out over the next couple of decades here in Wisconsin. Some other beetles to talk about. So this is another invasive species, the lily leaf beetle, which is a significant pest of true lilies, doesn't go after day lilies. First showed up in the state back in 2014 in Wausau area, so Marathon County, which you can see on that map from 2018. And in a couple of years since then, it, it's kind of moved just around the Wausau area a little bit into neighboring counties. But when we go from 2018 to 2019, we see some northward spread. We also see some big jumps on the map. What that tells me is that folks probably move some infested plant material because it pops up in Pierce County by the Twin Cities, pops up at the very tip of the thumb of Door County, and then it shows up in Madison area in, in Dane County in Southern Wisconsin. So three completely uh, widely distributed areas away from Wausau and Marathon County. And then we see in, in 2020, a foothold pops up in Southeastern Wisconsin. It's near Viroqua along the Mississippi. It's got a foothold now in the Fox River Valley, Green Bay and Appleton area and so on. So this insect is really starting to make its way around Wisconsin and cause a lot of problems for flower growers and, and landscapers. In some parts of the state, um, it's having a, a major impact on commercial flower growers where nurseries are no longer growing lilies because of this particular insect. Another invasive beetle worth mentioning, the viburnum leaf beetle has a, a similar story, showed up a, a number of years ago, except this time in southeastern Wisconsin, this can be a significant pest of viburnums. That includes native species like arrowwood viburnum and stuff like that. And unfortunately, our native species tend to get clobbered by this insect which isn't too surprising because it is a non-native species. So for the first couple of years, it was established right in the four county area where uh, Milwaukee, Waukesha, Washington, and Ozaukee County come together. So that's really the epicenter in Wisconsin. By uh, 2018, we had a, a detection in Oshkosh area, Winnebago County, still been fairly quiet around there. But then we had a detection in Kenosha County. Now, if you know much about Kenosha County, Southern Kenosha County down by Highway 50, there's a lot of plant nurseries down there. So we don't quite know how it got to that part of the state. Um, we do know this insect is in Chicago area, so it did simply come up from the south. Was it through movement of nursery stock? Don't know at this point, but it got a foothold there. Then when we jump to 20, from 2018 to 2020, we see it starting to fill in in southeastern Wisconsin. Uh, we see it jumping up to Hurley up in Iron County, far northern Wisconsin. We see it made a jump to uh, Dane County. So these days, Middleton as well 
well as many parts of Madison, Fitchburg, and Verona are having problems with this insect. And then in 2020, we also had confirmed finds in Brown and Sheboygan County. So it was detected up in a botanical garden in Green Bay area. And then just this last year, it's moved into Vilas uh, County and then Marathon County. Wausau, again, has a couple of detections of this. So it's really starting to make its way around Wisconsin. If you live in Madison, I've seen a lot of damage just wandering around various parts of the town when I'm out for a walk with my wife and, and my son. And uh, I've seen a lot of damage out there. So it's really starting to rear its ugly head in certain parts of the state. And it only takes a year or two for it really to get up to full steam and cause some significant damage. Now, 2020 um, was a, a really interesting year in terms of Asian lady beetles. And this is that species that likes to sneak indoors in the fall. Um, and for quite a few years, they had been relatively quiet in many parts of the state, especially Southern Wisconsin. There's a bit more activity in more Northern areas, but I suspect due to weather patterns, had a really good year last year in 2020. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we had a repeat of that this year in 2021. So this is of course what they look like when they are are very, very abundant, especially in late fall. If we're getting some warmer days in like early October, you know, there's a lot of activity out there. Um, those changing and fluctuating temperatures are a signal to that beetle that winter is coming and that they need to seek shelter indoors. And so that causes them to hang out on the sides of structures. They actually uh, take some visual cues in their native range in China. They use vision to uh, find cracks and crevices in cliff faces. So they are, are very good at picking out vertical lines. Well, if you think about homes and other structures with siding and gutters and stuff like that, it uh, can look somewhat like a cliff face with these vertical lines, uh, which might be interpreted as cracks and crevices. So lots of cases last year in September and October of these insects being very abundant on sides of buildings and sneaking in. And then if they pop out during the winter months, you can have lots of activity indoors that time of the year. Switching gears to true flies, the order diptera. So these are things like mosquitoes and, and horse flies. And there's certain ones that I see every year. And there's one group of flies that we just commonly refer to as small flies in, in the pest control industry because, well, they're not particularly big. Some of these, like our run of the mill fruit flies, can be problems in, in residential settings, but also commercial settings like restaurants and stuff like that. Um, so I do see those uh, coming into the lab throughout the year. So no real changes with some of these pests. Do to COVID, there are some uh, more unusual types of fruit flies, uh, so-called darker fruit flies, which have uh, more of a brownish mottled color on the body. Some other ones like lesser dung flies pop up on occasion as well. So no real changes with those in terms of COVID. Um, same kind of thing with black flies, no changes with COVID. Although I did see a little bit more uh, activity and perhaps more reports because I think with COVID, folks might have been spending more time outdoors, either in natural areas or in their own backyard. So for a couple of years now, I've been getting lots of reports of black flies, especially during the months of June and into early July. Uh, although this year, 2021, with the warm spring and, and kind of warm up uh, of the year, that activity seemed to shift a little bit earlier. I had a lot of calls and complaints about these more so in the month of G uh, May and into early June. So it seemed to shift things a couple weeks earlier due to our weather patterns this year. In terms of mosquitoes, uh, to give a little bit of perspective, we'll look at a couple different years here in a lot of situations. And, and I saw Susan is on. So when we're done, if she has any thoughts, um, you know, by all means, Susan, jump in and, and share your thoughts as well. But from my perspective at the diagnostic lab, based on reports I was getting, you know, 2019 seemed to be a, a pretty rainy year in most areas and, and lots of, of mosquito calls I was getting from around the state, including some of our floodwater mosquitoes and so on. Uh, in 2020, it seemed to vary quite a bit depending on where you were located. Some parts of the state did have some pretty dry conditions later in the summer, um, whereas I had lots of calls still from northern parts of the state last year. And then 2021 this year, I've had very few calls and complaints about mosquitoes at the diagnostic lab. And it makes sense if you think about our dry conditions this year at various points in time, much of the state was experiencing dry, droughty, even um, in some cases, extreme drought conditions, such as in far southeastern Wisconsin. And so the dry conditions at various parts of the year can impact mosquito numbers. Now, recently, we've had a little bit more rain in many parts of the state. So I've started getting an increase in, in calls and uh, emails about mosquitoes out there. But uh, overall, in many areas, 
activity seemed to be below average this year. Now, some good news about mosquitoes is we haven't had a whole lot of West Nile virus activity uh, as of late. Uh, I was just on the CDC website a day or so ago, and, and based on the numbers I saw, we haven't had any reports for Wisconsin yet this year that I've seen. Uh, we did, however, last year have a couple of cases of Eastern equine encephalitis, which actually can be a fatal disease. There was a fatality up near the Eau Claire Chippewa Falls area as well. So we do have uh, still some disease concerns out there. So even if there's not many mosquitoes out there, you don't want to let your guard down entirely. And then one thing I noticed the last couple of years, especially as we get to about this time of the year, when we do get some heavier rains, we can get some very, very large mosquitoes, including our largest one in the state, which we call the Gallinip or Sorophora ciliata. So the last couple of years, I have had quite a few reports of those out there in Wisconsin. And then one other fly case to talk about. So this is a good example where uh, historically pre-COVID, I would probably encourage an individual to uh, either bring in some samples to the diagnostic lab or, or head to the post office or send me some in the mail. But uh, with COVID folks, you know, we couldn't really do that very well um, in terms of getting a sample. And so just chatting with them over the phone, I could ask questions or, or get descriptions like this. And sometimes there are some very unusual clues which can be diagnostic. And in this case, there is a type of shrub called a boxwood, which we've all probably seen at one point or another. They're rather nice looking plants. They're evergreen shrubs. You can prune them into hedges and, and things like that. It turns out that there is a tiny type of fly that the larvae live inside the leaves. So if you think of the plant leaf as an Oreo cookie, you have the upper and lower epidermis. These insects basically live in that frosting layer inside the leaf. So they're very, very small. They're these yellowish or orangish larvae that live within there. And this picture on the right hand side of the screen, you can actually see where that leaf has been torn open, where I was dissecting it, you can see the larvae inside of there. The thing is, when these are feeding, they sometimes can actually produce audible noise. And that can be a diagnostic clue to identify these. And the noise they make, it actually sounds just like Rice Krispie cereal when you pour some milk on it. So I mentioned earlier, sometimes cases, uh, it involves me asking a series of questions over the phone. And sometimes there are unusual clues like this that can help crack the case. One other reason I'm mentioning this, um, so I have seen an increase in reports of this particular insect, the boxwood leaf miner. I don't think that they're necessarily increasing in number though. What may be going on is there is another problem with boxwoods, a disease called boxwood blight, which my colleague Brian Huddleston has been taking a lot of samples um, to check for boxwood blight. And if Brian gets a sample in, he ends up often suspecting some insect activity and he'll have me take a look at all as well at the sample. So I've been documenting more of these insects in the landscape. I don't have the impression that they're necessarily increasing though. Now let's switch to hymenopters. So these are things like the ants and bees and wasps and, and sawflies uh, and so on. Uh, and if 2020 were an insect, and, and by the way, if you think about it, 2020 was kind of the year no one really asked for because of COVID. Well, if 2020 were an insect, it would probably be this insect, the Asian giant hornet, which when the New York Times article came out calling them the murder hornet, my life got very, very busy because all of a sudden everyone was thinking they had found a murder hornet in in their yard. Uh, to date, by the way, we haven't had any cases in Wisconsin or the Midwest or anywhere close to us. I'll talk more about that in a second. But uh, because of this particular insect, which isn't in Wisconsin, I had a lot of cases associated with it in the last year or so. So let's look at a snapshot of tracking that Asian giant hornet. And at the moment, it's only known from some records in far southwestern British Columbia, including on Vancouver Island, and then far northwestern Washington state where those red dots are on the map. Those are the only spots in North America where we have had records of this insect. However, you can imagine folks out in Washington state, they are worried about this and, and everyone's thinking they're finding it. And so they have been doing a lot of screening and and, and cases from the public and, and looking at things. And uh, there's actually an interactive website where you can click on any one of these circles and, and find out what the insect was that was identified. So here's just some examples of the things that are being spotted. Here's a case uh, and the entomologist comments, thanks for the submission, that's a bumblebee. So stuff like that. In general, if it looks big, people tend to think it's an Asian giant hornet. Here's another one. That is a scoliad wasp, please let it go. 
This is a stonefly, a harmless native aquatic insect, so not even anything with a stinger in that case. And then this one, this is a native elm sawfly, please don't kill any more. So lots of cases like that in Washington state. And I've had many cases along those lines here in Wisconsin. I, I mentioned earlier when I have conversations with folks, sometimes I have to uh, kind of communicate to them that these are harmless native insects and we really don't need to be concerned about them or do anything to harm them as well. So just to give you an example of some of the lookalikes here in Wisconsin, number one, and, and these are active at the moment, so I see lots of reports of these currently, cicada killer wasps in the upper left-hand corner. They're one of our largest wasps, about an inch and a half long, um, with that large size and the fact that they look like a wasp. A lot of times folks think that that may be an Asian giant hornet, but it's really a, a common thing, and they're solitary nesters. They don't have a big colony to defend, so they're really rather docile. The males, if you get close to a nest, they will kind of bluff charge you and fly around you, but the males can't sting. So if you were to get stung by these, it's probably because you grabbed one barehanded. Um, they're really quite harmless. Same kind of story with the great golden digger wasp in the upper right hand corner. Really pretty harmless, uh, solitary wasp, very common this time of the year. And then there's a creature called a horn tail in the bottom left. I have lots of sightings of those in the last year or so. Those are actually associated with dead dying trees. They ovipause or lay eggs in rotting wood. That's where their larvae develop. So unless you're a, a piece of decaying wood, they're really going to leave you alone. Now, I actually had it uh, pretty good here. Wisconsin is kind of in the Goldilocks range, because if you go farther east of us, then you start bumping into this creature, the European hornet, which is in the same genus as the Asian giant hornet. It's from Europe, of course, you can tell by the name, and it's established in the eastern U.S. We don't have, uh, you know, the murder hornet stories with those, that sort of thing, and it's really um, not that much of an issue, but places like Indiana, Pennsylvania, the Carolinas, and so on, it can be very common there. I suspect if we had those in Wisconsin, I probably would have had even more overall um, kind of uh, uh, misaligned uh, reports of, of folks thinking they had found Asian giant hornets when it was really something else. So with that said, what about uh, these so-called murder hornets? Are they really a threat to Wisconsin? Well, if you look at the map here again, uh, that insect is only known from far northwestern Washington state and nearby parts of British Columbia. From there to Madison, Wisconsin is about 1500 miles, so no threat to us at this time. I've been keeping an eye on the situation, of course, but things have actually been really quiet this year. I think there was one sighting back in June. It was a dead specimen. Otherwise, things have been very, very quiet. Um, and uh, we're still fairly early in the ballgame. We don't know for sure if that insect is even going to necessarily establish long term farm in uh, North America. So something to keep an eye on. But in terms of the overall threat of murder hornets, you know, when uh, news articles started calling them murder hornets, a lot of folks got really scared. And I dug into some of the demographic information from the Japanese government. So just to kind of give you some perspective, here is this uh, bar chart, and it's showing the number of annual deaths reported in Japan. So the light blue bars, that is a category which consists of deaths associated with hornets, wasps, and bees. So those light blue bars could could include deaths due to Asian giant hornets, could also include allergic reactions to bee stings or wasp stings and, and things of that nature. And in a typical year for the country of Japan, we're maybe seeing 15 to 20 deaths in an entire year. So not that many when you think of the millions and millions and millions of people that live in Japan. Just to put things in a little bit of perspective though, the dark blue bars, you can see that on average, those are about twice as many deaths uh, associated with that category, which I'll reveal here in just a second compared to uh, the light blue bars. Those dark blue bars, that's a demographic code for drowning and submersion, following a slip into a bathtub. So how many of us are really afraid of using the bathtub? So to put things in perspective, I think that's really helpful to think about things like this, that that term murder hornet really is kind of sensationalized. All right, some other things that have been very common in the last couple of years, and, and I have had a distinct increase in reports of, of this particular type of ant. I'm guessing just because more folks are home, working from home, going on walks with family and, and so on. Pavement ants, if you go out and you see these, um, you know, hundreds or thousands of ants on your sidewalk, you'll actually have colonies that are duking it out for territory and so on. So those particular ants have been very common in the last uh, couple of years. Lots of reports of those, as well as this ant, the odorous house ant. So this is one of the commonest ants I see during the spring months. And remember with COVID, it's been harder for folks to get samples in. Um, they don't 
necessarily want to bring in or go to the post office and mail in a sample. So this is a situation where uh, the ants are small, hard to tell from a photograph, but there's really a, a quick and dirty way that I can um, talk to folks and, and get some clues to see if we can identify this one. And it turns out if you took one of these ants and crushed it with your fingers and, and then smelled that, they have a distinctive odor that smells kind of like either rotten coconut, some folks describe it, or in other cases, blue cheese. So it does have a very noticeable odor. So we don't necessarily think about that. And when you're working through taxonomic keys, you don't necessarily see clues like that. Yet with fresh specimens, that can be a really easy way, a good diagnostic feature to identify insects like that. And it's come in very handy during the COVID pandemic. In terms of social wasps, yellow jackets, bald faced hornets, paper wasps, lots of reports of these over the last year or two. So those really don't seem to have been impacted by COVID in terms of the number of number of reports that I've had. Shifting to Lepidoptera, these are the moths and butterflies and also their larvae, the, the caterpillar stage. Um, one really important one to discuss would be this creature, Lymantria dispar is a scientific name for it. Um, historically, it's been known as the gypsy moth, although the name is being changed. The new name has not been determined yet. Um, so it's kind of the insect formerly known as a gypsy moth and will have a new common name uh, at some point. But the story with this one, for a long time, gypsy moth numbers had been down in the state. So if we look at 2018, 2017, and, and so on in 2019, their numbers have generally been low. If you think about those years, they were really pretty rainy years. When you have lots of rain, there's actually a fungal disease called Entomophaga myomyga that can kick in and kill off gypsy moth caterpillars, sometimes causing their populations to almost crash overnight. Also, some of the, the polar vortex activity, those cold temperatures can actually be lethal to exposed egg masses. So in 2019, their numbers were low. With 2020, we had somewhat drier conditions in some areas. So their numbers seem to be on the increase last year. And then we, of course, know how uh, the drought played out this year with some rather dry conditions, meaning that the fungal disease didn't kick in. So lots of reports this year in 2021 of gypsy moth caterpillars. And more recently, the adult gypsy moths. And in the picture on the right, we see a female gypsy moth, that pale whitish moth in that photo. She is not capable of flying, so she has to use a, a pheromone to attract the males, which fly to her. They mate, and then she lays all her eggs basically in one basket. She'll lay this big egg mass about an inch or two long, and in that egg mass, it could have 500 to upwards of maybe 1,000 eggs. And so walking around um, where I live in middle area, I've seen oak trees, for example, where I can easily count 50 to 100 eggs, uh, egg masses. And so if you have 100 egg masses times 1,000, that tree next spring could potentially have 100,000 gypsy moth caterpillars on it. So this is something that has really built up. Now, it's going to be hard to tell what's going to happen next year. If 2022 is another dry year, look out. I'm nervous for a situation like that. Hopefully, if we get a rainy spring next year, that may cause their populations to crash back down. But uh, gypsy moth has really popped up across the state this year. Some other Lepidoptera worth mentioning, there's a newer non-native species called the purple carrot seed moth. Um, when it first got in a couple years ago in about 2018, we weren't sure how much of an impact it would have. Uh, it does cause a little bit of damage, but it's not killing plants outright. The problem with this particular insect is it does affect some uh, garden herbs that folks like to grow for culinary purposes, things like dill, coriander, and other things from the carrot family. And what the caterpillars do, and you can see a caterpillar, the upper right hand corner, they're very distinctive. They're olive greenish color with white polka dots on their body. They will go into the umbel or flower head of dill and related plants and they'll use silken webbing to tie those structures together. That's basically going to ruin it uh, to use that part of the plant for culinary purposes. You could use other parts perhaps, but uh, it has been spreading around the state over the last couple of years. So most of the southeastern corner of the state has uh, this insect. It also has made a jump over to Clark County and kind of central Wisconsin as well. So it's definitely moving its way around Wisconsin. It can be pretty common. I just saw some on my uh, dill plant, which is potted on my back deck in Middleton a couple of days ago.
In terms of some butterfly news, uh, unfortunately, it's not great news for the monarch butterflies. This uh, graph here shows the total area occupied by overwintering monarchs. So scientists don't go out and count the number of actual butterflies. They estimate the area that is uh, occupied. And we can see a downward trend over time with those particular insects. So they're not in a great spot. The US Fish and Wildlife Service did go through uh, an endangered uh, species listing assessment Late last year in December 2020, they uh, released their findings and basically what they came up with, they listed as warranted but precluded. What that means is, yes, they uh, need protection, but unfortunately there are other species in more dire straits that are basically in line in front of them. So it, it's not a good situation at the moment for monarchs. Um, however, a little bit of good news, this year they do, do seem to be doing pretty well despite the drier conditions. I've had lots of sightings and reports of these coming into the diagnostic lab. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed, maybe they will uh, kind of bump up their overwintering habitat um, area this winter, but we won't know that until February. In uh, a couple of months ago, early summer, I had lots of reports of this butterfly, Hackberry Emperors, especially in southern Wisconsin, so Dane, Rock, Green County, and uh, so on. In some cases, folks were spotting these by the thousands or tens of thousands, and they're actually very fond of, of sweat. So they'll land on you, they'll, they'll lap up sweat from your skin to get to those salts. So kind of a, a cool thing that just uh, was an ephemeral passing fleeting thing that popped up uh, earlier this summer. And then one really interesting thing, some very large moths. These are not native to Wisconsin. The black witch moths are native to areas such as Mexico, but they can get carried northwards with uh, weather systems. So often I will see a couple of reports after a big tropical storm or, or hurricane. So in 2020, I saw some sightings of these after tropical storm uh, Cristobal or Hurricane Sally. And then earlier this year in June, tropical storm Claudette, the jet stream must have carried some of these up to Wisconsin, as well as after Hurricane El last month in July. I will say it, it's been fascinating to me. I have seen more reports of these giant moths and, and they've got a wingspan of about five, six, seven inches sometimes. I've had more reports this year in 2021 than probably in the last two, three years combined. So for whatever reason, the weather patterns we've been having in the US um, have really been helping some of these get up here to the Midwest where they're not native to our area. And there's uh, some literature out there that has really documented how these things can get moved very, very readily by storms such as hurricanes. Switching gears a little bit to some of the true bugs, brown marmorated stink bug has really been um, getting a good foothold in the state since it showed up about a decade ago. And these days it's very common in places like Madison and Janesville, as well as southeastern Wisconsin. So locally common in some of those areas. Last year was a very good year for this insect, the minute pirate bug. These are actually beneficial predatory insects that hang out on flowers. You can find them this time of the year. The problem is that in late summer and early fall, when we have nice warm days, these will sometimes land on humans and accidentally bite them. Um, for the most part, they're beneficial predators of other insects, but they can be a little bit of a nuisance when they bite in that regard. Bed bugs, I've seen a distinct decrease in reports over the last year or so with the pandemic, which makes perfect sense if you ask me. Simply put, people haven't been traveling as much. Bed bugs can be associated with uh, hotels and, and traveling and things like that. And with a lot of folks staying home, I simply haven't had as many reports or cases of bed bugs in about the last year and a half. And then a quick note about uh, periodical cicadas. We, of course, didn't have brood 10 this year. We will see brood 13, though, in 2024. They last emerged in 2007. However, there are sometimes individuals that pop out out of cycle. Those are known as stragglers. And last year, I did see some reports of stragglers in Wisconsin, including uh, Deerfield area in uh, southeastern Dane County, Lake Geneva area, and then also a bunch of reports in Chicago area. So that's just kind of a little bit of, of a tease. We're going to see a lot more of these in uh, three more years from now, 2024. And then um, my most interesting case of the year that I will mention. So this is a kind of an insect mystery. And I'll, I think I'll end on this slide because uh, I'm getting short on time. But this is really an international mystery, which involved a tiny insect, um, a Jeep, Wapaka, Wisconsin, Turin, Italy, scientific articles from at least six different countries, 
and one vicarious entomologist. That would be me if you haven't figured that out already. So the case goes something like this. I received a call from a pest control company in Wapaka, Wisconsin, and uh, chatting with the individual over the phone, he described what he thought were stink bugs. And this is a good example of why I wish we used the metric system, because on the phone, he had mentioned that the insects were about five eighths of an inch, which is just over half an inch long. And I was thinking, OK, that sounds like certain stink bugs. Why don't you send me some pictures just for the heck of it so we can confirm? Got the pictures and said, that doesn't look like a stink bug at all. I, I'm not entirely sure what that is. And I requested some specimens. They came in. Of course, they were not five eighths of an inch long. They were more like five sixteenths of an inch long. So big difference there. Again, metric system would have uh, made this much easier. So when I received the specimens, I start keying them out in the uh, uh, literature and going through taxonomic keys. Now, the thing is, when you're going through a taxonomic key, if you've done this before, occasionally you'll bump into something that has an asterisk. And that usually means one of two things. It either means you took a wrong turn in the key somewhere, or it means you found something really weird, including maybe something that shouldn't be there. So uh, when we read about this family, heterogastridae um, describes their anatomy a bit, but it says only two species, both Western, occur in North America. So finding these in Wapaka, Wisconsin, didn't really make any sense. Um, then to uh, kind of uh, make the story more elaborate. Um, it turns out, I, I called back the pest control operator, the Jeep that uh, these insects had been in um, originated in Europe, particularly Turin, Italy, where there's a Jeep factory. Now, the thing about this Jeep is it had been shipped to New Jersey uh, last year in 2020. It made it through the winter last year, but every time this woman would turn the Jeep on, some of these insects would come crawling out of the vents and things like this, which was highly unusual. So I got some specimens, start working with them. Now, the problem is that family, which we don't have in the Midwest, it was hard to find literature for. So I had to go on this search, tracking down uh, primary literature from about uh, half a dozen different European and Asian countries, places like Scandinavia, Turkey, France, Italy, Spain, and, and so on. Now, if this were 20, 30 years ago, I would not have been able to understand any of that. But these days with websites like Google Translate, I can read some of those other uh, pieces of literature. And ultimately it led me to a PDF scan copy of this book, a French book by Jean Pericard uh, about the Hemiptera family Lygiidae in France. And there, lo and behold, I found the keys that I needed to identify this insect. It happened to be the species Platyplax enormous, which is known from arid parts of the Mediterranean. So it just goes to show it's kind of a cool example how insects can get moved around from one part of the globe to another part of the globe. Ultimately, it turns out this species and actually the whole family is on the USDA APHIS uh, regulated plant pest list. So I had to get in touch with colleagues at APHIDS. They had to follow up and ultimately the individual ended up getting a new Jeep, which doesn't have insects in it. So I guess you got a free Jeep lease for uh, about half a year or so. So with that said, Tom, I think I'm going to wrap it up there and, and take questions at this point. That'd be great. Thank you for a wonderful talk. And then if uh, anybody would like to type questions in the chat or speak up, uh, either way. So if anybody would like to launch us, let's see what we got here. Um, you already answered my questions about the high quality cameras and especially the video. Uh, Dareth is asking, what is the best control of viburnum leaf beetle? Good question. Uh, it really is gonna depend on the situation. Um, if you have uh, viburnums that are some of our, our native species or, or cultivars of viburnums that happen to get a lot of damage, the best solution in the long run might be removal and replacement with some other type of plant that doesn't get as much damage. Otherwise, you're going to have to put up a pretty significant fight every single year to prevent damage. Some of our, our native viburnums like arrowwood probably within a couple of years, those plants might be dead because of that particular pest. So that's always a consideration. Some other things that can be done, um, you can go out during the winter months actually and look for the egg laying pits. What they do is the females go to twigs and they chew these little divots and they'll lay about five or six eggs and then they cover it up with sawdust. And I did show a picture of that in my slide, but you can actually look at twigs and you'll just see all these little round divots on the twigs. 
if during the winter months you went out and found those, you could prune those out and destroy them. You could burn those twigs. You could, um, you know, bury them, send them to the landfill or, or whatnot. You wouldn't want to prune them and put them on the ground right next to the plant, but uh, that would be an option to help control them. Um, there are also ultimately some insecticide sprays that folks have been having to use to protect the foliage. Um, but anytime we do that, there can be some current some concerns about you know pollinators or other insects in the area at the time that we're spraying. So uh, we do have an extension fact sheet on that one. If you are interested in that, feel free to shoot me an email. Email, or if you do a Google search for Viburnum leaf beetle Wisconsin, you should be able to find that fact sheet pretty easily. It's got more uh, detailed information in there. Mike Ripp is asking ladybugs versus Asian lady beetles, question mark. Yeah, so ladybugs and, and lady beetles basically mean the same thing. It refers to family beetles, the coccinellidae. There's a whole bunch of different species out there. We, of course, have many native species. The multicolored Asian lady beetle that I mentioned, that's a species that likes to sneak indoors uh, in the fall. And that's a, a non-native species. It is from parts of Eastern Asia, such as China. But uh, it is a type of lady beetle. Also, it, it's a type of ladybug. They're the same thing. Vivian Thomas uh, writes, okay, those caterpillars on the bouquet I had a few weeks ago were purple carrot seed moth caterpillars. I was wondering what those were. Yeah, very common on, uh, as I said, dill. I've seen them on coriander. I've also seen them on uh, Queen Anne's lace. So just about anything from the carrot family, they seem to be able to go to. Again, they don't seem to cause that much overall damage, but it can be quite noticeable when that bell-shaped umbel is just kind of tied together with silk and, and looks more like that. Um, I was wondering, PJ, do you ever give your samples to the Wisconsin Research Insect Collection? I do, yes, uh, especially if it is something um, like a, a new pest detection for the first time. So new state records, new county records, things like that. I do hold on to those and uh, deposit those in the Wisconsin Insect Research Collection. I did manage to save a, a couple of that weird insect, the last one from the Jeep. I had to send the samples off to colleagues at USDA APHIS. Um, they sent them off and I requested on the paperwork to get them back, but they got sent to the Smithsonian. I don't think I'll ever see those specimens ever again, but uh, I managed to hold on to a couple of them to go upstairs to our research collection. Very nice. Uh, Edie Brandt says, my husband saw what he thinks were rusty patched bumblebees near Phelps last week. Can you comment on their status? Yeah, so good question. And um, recently, actually, I have had just in the last week, uh, three cases where folks had emailed me pictures of rusty patch bumblebees, all from southern Wisconsin. I think one case was from Dane County, actually two cases from Dane County, one case from Walworth County. So they are definitely out there. It is encouraging to see them. Uh, I know across the country they have been declining because historically there were records more to the east of us as well. But at least at the moment, um, based uh, on the reports I've been getting, uh, I've seen a fair number of them, which is, is good to see and, and good to hear that uh, folks are spotting those out there. And I just had to look it up, but uh, Phelps is up in Vilas County. Um, Phelps is Vilas. Okay. Um, that would surprise me. I wasn't entirely sure where Phelps was. Um, when I think of the maps I've seen for Rusty Patch, it does tend to be more of the southern part of the state. Um, when it comes to bumblebees, um, Rusty Patch can actually be a little bit of a letdown in terms of its coloration if you haven't seen them before. They really don't have much, much rust color on the body. Um, on their abdomen, the, the final body region, it's mostly black. Um, the first two segments are yellowish and there's just a little patch in the middle of their back of rusty reddish color. We do have about two or three other very common uh, bumblebees that have some very distinctive rusty reddish color. It's the same reddish rusty color, but it'll often be an entire band. So I suspect given that location in the state, it probably was one of these other species that just have the rusty color on them. Great. Uh, Mike Ripp is asking, is it just the invasive ladybugs that bite? I don't remember the native species biting when I was young. Yeah, good question. So personally, I, I have been um, kind of nipped by the uh, non-native lady beetles. 
Um, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think that I have been nipped by any of the native ones that I've handled. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure if the native ones would ever nip. It's just something that um, when I hear of those insects biting, it tends to be in fall when they are migrating in large numbers. And I don't know if they just get kind of worked up into a frenzy and, and accidentally bite a little bit. Um, they're not trying to use you as a, a food or meal, anything like that. I think it's more of an accidental thing when it does happen. Sounds good. Any other questions that people would like to speak or type in the chat? Uh, do you know when your next um, visit to the Larry Mueller show is going to be? Oh, it's in October. I can tell you the exact date pretty easily. I think it's the 20, 20th, Wednesday, October 20th at 11 a.m. Very good. And are you on for 45 minutes with Larry? An hour and a half. You do the get, whole time. Whoa. I get I get the full time. <laughs> good stuff. Yeah. Um, any idea? Uh, this is from Robert Schubert. Any idea what the small insects that fall out of a kitchen fan in May and June are? Oh, that's a good question. I that's would say in, in th that case, it'd be really helpful for me to see some pictures or a, a physical sample under the microscope um, just to hear more about them. I, I don't think of any insect right off the top of my head that I would expect that type of behavior from. Uh, there are certain things that might sneak in from outdoors on occasion um, and, and might be coming out of weird spots, but I think I'd really need to see some of them uh, to give you a more definitive answer on that. Uh, Robert says they're small, but I have a collection, so he might um, be sending you something soon. Yeah. Lots of people are saying thanks for a great talk, and Edie says it's always enjoy getting to listen to you, PJ. And um, let's see. Oh, is uh, Gene and Russ Larum are asking, is it reasonable to try to protect monarch caterpillars? Yeah, good question. Um, if you think about in the grand scheme of things, and, and this might be a little depressing to hear, but when you think about monarchs going from the egg to the adult stage, most of them die for one reason or other. They get eaten by something else. They uh, die from a disease or, or environmental conditions. The mortality rate uh, between egg and the migratory adult stage, it's over well over 90%. So most of them die. Um, if you are, are doing things like rearing or keeping them in containers, you know that's a way that you might be able to keep predators away from them. There are some concerns expressed about rearing monarchs. Um, there are some situations where if you aren't doing it properly, there could be some diseases that could pop up. So for example, if you are rearing a bunch of monarch caterpillars together in the same box, if one of them had a, a disease, which can be somewhat common, it could potentially spread to others. So there are some concerns with that. Um, otherwise, there's naturally a, a really a pretty high mortality rate out there too. Very good. All right, well, thank you very much. The, the uh, sun is putting on a very nice orange crepuscule right now. And I think that'll be a good time to say thanks again. A lot of people are saying, uh, given their appreciation, and uh, I guess one more thing, are you, are you heading back into the office regularly in a few weeks or are you gonna be able to stay in your basement? Yeah, so at, at this point I've been going in pretty much full days on Mondays and Wednesdays, as well as either a Thursday or a Friday uh, at this point. So it, it's kind of half here, half there at the moment. Well, we lost you there for a second. Oh. See? Yeah, if the audio cut out, I'm spending a fair amount of time on campus. It, it's probably about half and half at the moment, though. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again, and uh, hope to see everybody next week. And thanks for coming tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Tom. Oh, thank you. This is great. Really appreciate it. See everybody next week, I hope.